We present the news quiz with your chairman, Simon Hoggart. Hello, welcome to the news quiz. We start with an item from the National Federation of Badger Group's News, Spring Issue. Cymag is a powder that releases cyanide gas on contact with moisture. It's extremely dangerous. The product should therefore be disposed of by a licensed waste contractor. It should not be given to the police. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks to Bob Dennison of Powys who sent that in. Please welcome, first on my right, Andy Hamilton and Linda Smith. And opposite them on my left, Alan Corran and Fred McCauley. Andy, summit for the weekend? For a terrible moment there, I was thinking, there hasn't been a story about barbers this weekend. (laughs) Um, Well, this is the G8 conference, which begins actually next week, I think, next Wednesday. But in the meantime, there's going to be all the rock concerts, which I'm all in favour of. I I rather feel that um, Bono, or Bono, or the the, the U2 bloke, I rather think he's let himself down this week because in a week where the focus is very much on solving world poverty, he's got in an argument over ownership of a hat. (laughs) Anyway, I'll be watching until Elton John comes on. (laughs) And sadly, the Spice Girls never made it, which is uh, pretty good, really. (laughs) Who else else is on, Andy? Dido. (laughs) Um, Dido. I hope it rains, because there'll be Cliff Richard, and I will enjoy it. <laughs> there are gigs on all over the world, aren't there? There's Japan, America, yeah. London, and uh, I read that Chris de Berg is going to be in Berlin, and I would love to overhear that phone call to Geldof. Yes, it's Chris de Berg here, uh, Bob. I'd love to help. Uh, will I be in London with Sir Paul McCartney? <laughs> uh, no. Well, Philadelphia, then, with Stevie Wonder, then. Is it? No. Uh, no. You're in Berlin with Kraftwerk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Senior officials from the G8 nations have flown to Britain in advance of the Glen Eagle Summit for a weekend of talks on climate change, debt relief and global trade. The Americans are against cancelling African countries' debts unless they sign up to anti-corruption proposals, which is pretty rich coming from the nation that brought us Halliburton, Enron and Martha Stewart. <laughs> Linda, who identified themselves as card-carrying supporters this week? Tony Blair has won a a sort of slender victory on the subject of ID cards. But it's not been plain sailing, and there's been a lot of uh, debate either way. And he seems to have backpedalled a bit on the reason for it, doesn't he? Because to begin with, it was all sort of grandiose things like anti-terror and keeping all sorts of 'er ne'er-do-wells out of the country. And now it's things like, well, you'll find it easier to get a library book out. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's no, right. and I, you can't help thinking, well, I've already got a little gizmo that helps me with that. It's got a library card. <laughs> yeah, and but it can't sc- scrape frost off your windscreen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Blair's... He's won, but he's saying things like, well, you know, of course, I didn't go into politics. This is his new phrase lately, isn't it? I didn't go into politics to, to push your ID cards, and mm. I didn't go into politics to wage war on Iraq. And you, he started to sound like Sir from Reggie Perry. <laughs> <laughs> he's got this new phrase as well. He says, it's an idea whose time has come. Yeah. Which I think is rather good. You can say that about anything. You could nick someone's car and say, I thought stealing your car was an idea whose time has come. <laughs> Expense. There's been a lot of uh, yeah. controversy about I the mean, potential. Didn't the, um, the LSE say it was going to cost 300 well, quid a pop? Well, what worries me is that I think what the LSE study said was, is that the ID card is going to be so expensive that only terrorists can afford to get one. <laughs> <laughs> What's particularly extraordinary about the ID card is it's, it's a result of an unholy marriage between Tony Blair and Ian Paisley. That's how he got it through, isn't it? Ian Paisley doesn't need an ID card, does he? He just <laughs> uses his voice. They're not gonna... Also, I mean, the thing about the ID card is, you know, what crimes will it prevent? It didn't stop my egg sandwich from being stolen from my fridge at lunch. <laughs> it's of no use at all no. in, in the crimes that matter. Mm. What Charles Clark is doing about that, I do not know. <laughs> Sorry, and Paisley giggling in the comments. No, you didn't. Yeah. No, that's, that's an <laughs> urban myth. <laughs> Were you tickling him? <laughs> what does Paisley giggling sound like? Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! What a giggle! <laughs> Voice 
frack a glasson, as I... <laughs> the ID Cards Bill passed its second reading in the Commons this week, despite a rebellion by Labour MPs, and among reports that the cost of the scheme was shortly going to spiral out of control. The all-singing, all-dancing biometric ID cards could cost up to £230 each, even more if you download the crazy frog onto it. <laughs> Fred, who's proved he's not bushwhacked by an Iraq backlash. Backlash. It's got to be Bush, George W. The clue is in the question. uh, The Americans uh, feel isn't doing the right job in Iraq by keeping the troops in there. But he went on TV to say that I'm afraid to say that the troops are going to stay in Iraq until the job's done because Bush says he doesn't know the meaning of the word retreat. Uh, And I would imagine there's lots of other words he doesn't know. Rumsfeld, on the other hand, was asked uh, how long it would take f- to, to get the troops out, and he said something like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve years. Yeah. And I, I haven't heard, haven't heard accounting like that since we were told <laughs> how much the Channel Tunnel was going to cost. <laughs> In fact, uh, and Bush started his speech, uh, and as he always does, by mentioning 9/11, which coincidentally were the only two numbers that Rumsfeld didn't use. <laughs> But it, I, I actually watched Bush on the TV, and you know, if you turn the sound right down, he, he makes a lot more sense. <laughs> I was just thinking, if it had been Scotland, he'd never have been elected. You can't elect someone called Bush. It's wonderful. Say it again. Bush. Ah, oh, love it. Bushwhacked. Say world again. World. Oh. <laughs> Actually, he's so looking forward to coming to Scotland next week, he says, because many of his ancestors were Irish. <laughs> President George W. Bush addressed the American people this week in an attempt to bolster support at home for the war in Iraq. Bush's speech was designed to boost morale, though he did miss the obvious morale-boosting trick of announcing his own resignation. (laughs) Alan, why won't bewigged bother boys be named and shamed? Big wig? This is about judges? Yes. The judges are up to something, surprisingly. Um, judges are going around in their wigs in, in Blue Water Centre, kicking seven <laughs> bells out of people. <laughs> Do you know this, Andy? Well, I think so. Is this it... isn't about the sky blue frog they found in Sri Lanka. No. no that's not even nothing. coming up later, is it? <laughs> A really important thing happens. Is this thing that's wrong with this? They found the first blue frog in the world in Sri Lanka. There's only one of it. They're hopping around after it with cameras. It's in every... And we, we just pay no attention to it at all. Something's happened on the judiciary. This is ridiculous. <laughs> The world's gone Alan, mad. Its priorities are all askew. Aren't Alan, they? they don't know it's the first blue frog. Yes, they do. They it's got an identity card. It says first sky blue frog. <laughs> Andy, Andy, tell us about the judges. It's not as interesting as the sky blue frog. Right. That's it. That's it right there. Now, the story, I think, is that the incompetent judges who make mistakes are not going to be exposed. Is that correct? Well, only if they want to be. Only if they want to be. Is that the story? You more, or less, yes, more or less, yes. I'm, I'm losing the will to live, so I think... <laughs> This is the creation of the Office of Judicial Complaints, which will monitor the judiciary's disciplinary procedures, but will not make public the names of judges found guilty of misconduct. One judge was reprimanded for twice falling asleep during a trial, not appreciating that people usually have to pay a great deal of money to hear Mrs Blair ramble on. (laughs) (laughs) And at the end of round one, everybody has four points. And we start round two with a headline from the BBC News website. NHS doing better under Gibbons. (laughs) Thanks to many of you who spotted that. Andy, who said one sees many ships this week? Is this um, the reenactment of the Battle of Trafalgar? It was a, a, you know, I know it was an important battle that prevented us from being French and all that, but <laughs> an awful lot of men died at Trafalgar. In fact, there was so much blood on the decks that they thought it's pointless trying to clean the decks. They just painted over the blood. Blood disguiser yeah. does exactly what it says on the tin. <laughs> But it was a good excuse for a, a regatta. But I was rather concerned because I thought it was a rather flagrant breach of our national security because um, most of the people were out in little yachts and little boats and the Navy took a few of their uh, cruisers out. The French bought their biggest aircraft carrier. <laughs> and I watched it and I thought, this has got sneak attack written all over it. <laughs> Nobody's doing anything. We're welcoming them with open arms. And you know what the French are like? They never forget. And, uh, 
But uh, yes, yeah, so we commemorated the Battle of Trafalgar, and uh, so that the French and the Spanish wouldn't feel got at, they were not referred to as the French and Spanish fleet. One side was the Reds, and, and one side was the Blues. I don't know which was which. And they were described as winningly challenged. <laughs> I thought it was just absolutely delightful. It was the campest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was like Nelson the Musical, wasn't it? With those... <laughs> Wonderful, wasn't it? Kiss me hardy. Oh, chase me a bit first. <laughs> the Queen obviously enjoyed it. You think she was watching out? These, these, these were the days. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Andy, I don't think the Queen actually remembers Trafalgar. <laughs> It was more of a... I mean, for the Queen, it was more of a stock count. <laughs> Just counting off the ships. Once. <laughs> Not once. <laughs> came out in the same week as questions in the House, I noticed, about military underfunding. And I was uh, distressed to see that uh, the firework display it means we're practically defenceless now. If war were to break out, we wouldn't have a Catherine wheel. <laughs> Or a rocket to our name. I thought the firework display was confusing historically because I'm sure at the Battle of Trafalgar the sailors weren't going, Wee! Oh. <laughs> I bet if Thatcher was watching on TV, she'd have to be physically restrained like Hannibal Lecter, seeing all these ships. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the French one, she'd be going, Sink it! <laughs> it's sailing away, Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> In Servant this week, the Queen reviewed an international fleet and saw a reenactment marking the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. In order not to offend French and Spanish sensibilities, the fleets were referred to only as red and blue, an outdated system which has now been replaced by right wing and really right wing. <laughs> Nelson is one of Britain's best remembered seafarers, along with Francis Drake, Ellen MacArthur, and Robert Maxwell. <laughs> points to someone there. Linda, with the utmost of respect, you haven't answered my question. Yes, of course, John Humphreys. Now, since you're listening to this uh, on the Today programme, which was a bit zen, really, wasn't it? He was being quizzed by the Lord's select... Well, I suppose it's always quite select when it's Lords, isn't it? There's no riffraff. But uh, he was being quizzed by their committee, wasn't he, about... It was to do with the BBC uh, licence thingy. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Well, it's because whether he was... They put it to him that he was too aggressive and oh, biased. Oh, it, yeah. And he, he stuck up for himself and, and said, no, he wasn't, and... Uh, I think they quite enjoyed interrupting him. And, and I, I, they were making a bit of a point of it, weren't yeah, they? But he will get them when, oh. they, when they have to come on today next time. It'll be, ah, Lord Fowler, good morning. <laughs> and that will be the last polite thing he hears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm wondering, I mean, Charlotte, you, you have worked with the man. I have. John indeed. Humphreys, so settle the controversy. <laughs> John Humphreys, nice or nasty? <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't answered the question. Well, I'm not John Humphreys, am I? I let it go. Yeah. See, it's hard to do, isn't it, keeping up that level of barracking, really? Yeah. You've got to be quite committed. And possibly Welsh, I don't know. <laughs> do, do you think breakfast in the Humphreys' house is sometimes a bit fraught if he's in a bad mood? Well, probably not, because he wouldn't be there, would he? <laughs> Probably, no, that's probably true. Missy Sandwich was probably listening to Classic FM or something. <laughs> Tell me this, nobody takes his egg sandwich. <laughs> this week, a House of Lords committee examining the future of the BBC turned the tables on John Humphreys and questioned him about his aggressive interviewing. At the end of the meeting, Humphreys left the House of Lords, but not before taking all the peers' dinner money and giving Lord Maxon a Chinese burn. <laughs> Fred, listen to this. Do 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 down, do be do down, down. Breaking up is hard to do. Don't take your love away from me. Don't you leave my heart in misery. If you go, then I'll be blue. Cause breaking up is hard to do. Fred, why is breaking up a little less hard to do? Because there is an advice line or a website or something that can 
advise breaking up couples and what to do, as the song says. It's hard to do, but uh, there is now a sort of checklist of things to do. And in fact, there were a couple of stories about couples. I think that makes four. <laughs> and one was to say that couples who weren't married should have certain rights, uh, same as married people, or similar to. But it didn't say how long you had to be together to get those rights, which I think is a glaring omission, you know, because you might just think you're in for a bit of a horny weekend. <laughs> and by Monday morning, she's got half your pension. <laughs> as, for the, as for the breaking up, one of, the, one of the bits of advice is that you contact the bank and let them know about it, you know, so I can just see the, the phone go, yes, he's left me. He's left. I don't know how I'm going to get through the next few days. He's gone. Sort code 30562. Yes, a new online checklist helps cohabiting unmarried couples to deal with the breakup by advising on joint bank accounts, benefits and debts. <laughs> Records show that four million unmarried couples live together in England and Wales in what must be an enormous house. <laughs> Alan, what's fur the chop? Fur? Yes. The chop? Yes. Freddie's nodding. Conifer trees. 30-odd years ago, government grants were given out to plant conifers and... and they're chopping it down now. Chopping them down. To plant hardwoods. To, exactly. Mm. I think between the two of us, we've, we've got a couple of points. Mm. Yep. So yeah, British Rail were right all along. It was the wrong kind of leaves. <laughs> why, why are they chopping them down? Because they want to plant birch and oak. Mm. It's to stop grey It's the Forestry else. Commission. What are you going to do all day? You chop trees down, you put them in. You... <laughs> No, they just, that, that's what they do. They what, go up in their what about forestry the commission bands and they knock things down and put other things. What about what? Squirrels? Yeah, it's been That's the squirrel commission. <laughs> evergreen squirrels, it is. They're removing evergreen squirrels and uh, planting deciduous ones. <laughs> Here air falls out. They're bald squirrels everywhere. Millions of conifers and other non native species are to be felled in the next 20 years to regenerate indigenous trees in the English woodlands. Grants will be available to restock woods with broadleaf trees which are much faster than the old dial-up leaf trees. <laughs> <laughs> many of the conifers are now mature trees, though many immature trees still roam the forest, hot wearing squirrels and wearing hoodies. <laughs> and thanks to my unique scoring system, the scores at the end of round two are Alan and Fred seven, but Andy and Linda ahead with ten. Uh -huh. Before we start the final round, here's a cutting from a parish newsletter. Christian Aid, a big thank you to all who delivered and collected envelopes. Collection has topped £1,100 so far, and more is coming in. I'll be wanking collectors individually. <laughs> thanks to Mrs Cleavage for sending that one in. Andy, who believes medical fact has become a TV casualty. Well, this is um, medical professionals complaining that TV programmes give an inaccurate picture of how successful emergency procedures are. Because in casualty, somebody collapses, then they all go, quick, and they, and they all rally round and they say, clear, and then they cut to the following scene and the same person is lying there saying, thank you, doctor. And, <laughs> and what they're saying is that, that this means that the public expectation is that patients who are resuscitated should survive. And sadly, only, I think it's a third of them do. But obviously that will make a pretty depressing episode of Casualty <laughs> if 66% of the patients were, were dead before the end. Um, you know, it certainly wouldn't make a Christmas special. Um, so, so I don't know quite what they want, though. I, I couldn't quite follow whether they want TV medical dramas to be more realistic in which case it is going to be a lot more depressing. And also, who's going to watch a 14-hour episode of Casualty while the character waits in Casualty? <laughs> Speaking at the British Medical Association Conference, Dr Andrew Thompson accused medical dramas such as ER and Casualty of giving the public unrealistic expectations. Many avid viewers disagreed with the BMA, saying Casualty had taught them life-saving tips, such as never drive a car at high speed towards anything ramp-shaped. <laughs> and never stand next to someone who says, don't worry, I've been using chainsaws for years. <laughs> Linda, listen to this.
Linda Ware, calling to Bath University, should you be dissatisfied by this question? Well, frankly, I just don't enjoy doing this as much as I used to. Then all the fun's gone out of this show. I just feel, you know, I come here, it's only part-time, don't get paid enough. Andy, frankly, is no use whatsoever. <laughs> Sits there like a lemon, doesn't help out at all. As if I didn't have my own job to do here, he doesn't seem to appreciate that. And I think this is what you're driving at, isn't it, Simon? That women just aren't getting the job satisfaction that they used to. I don't know what it is. Somewhere in their little embroidery addled brains, <laughs> they've got the idea that the fact they're doing lots of work for not too much money is unsatisfactory. I don't know. No pleasing them, really. They don't even take the trouble to ride into the office side saddle. <laughs> yes, I, I can give you ten points for that. <laughs> don't give her ten points till she finishes the ironing. <laughs> A government-funded report into work habits says that women's job satisfaction has been in decline for 15 years. More women are in the workforce than ever before. Indeed, women now make up fully 25% of the news quiz panel. <laughs> Yeah, but, but that's just tokenism, Simon. <laughs> I think it's neither 27 and a half. No offence, Linda. <laughs> Fred, which species is on a road to nowhere? Uh, is it hedgehogs? There's more of them alive, or less of them dead. No, isn't there? it's the other way round. Well, there's more dead. Well, I mean, as it's always with hedgehogs, it's always the other way around. But yeah, they are, they are more dead than heretofore. All oh, right, I, I so thought it's a global warming. I, I actually know where the hedgehogs are. They're in Uist and Ben Becula. There are more hedgehogs there than than they want. So the Scottish National Heritage suggested that they be killed, and there was going to be a cull. And as if you didn't know this came from a quango in Scotland, the man that suggested how you cull the hedgehogs said that they should be given a lethal injection. <laughs> and there's only one word for somebody that dreams up an idea of going near a hedgehog with another needle. <laughs> and that's prick. <laughs> Some good guys suggested in the Outer Hebrides that they didn't want the hedgehogs killed. So they were offering 20 quid for every hedgehog that you captured and brought over onto the mainland and released onto the mainland. It's the Scottish equivalent of the common agricultural policy. <laughs> Take the hedgehogs over to the mainland, you release the hedgehogs, and then you just gather them up again and go over to the island and go, Oh, blimey, look at this! That release the hedgehogs. The Maybe hedgehogs they could use doom. them in the national lottery. Yeah. It would be better than the ping pong, wouldn't it? Release the hedgehogs. <laughs> Open up, and on their little tummies, they'd have a number shaved. <laughs> a new survey has shown that the number of hedgehogs on English roads has fallen by a fifth in three years. Hedgehogs eat slugs, snails, beetles, earthworms, and anything else cooked by Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. <laughs> Alan, who says Londoners should make water conservation their number one priority? I'm very tempted to say you're taking the piss. Um, this, is, um, this is the appalling Ken Livingstone, who, um, faced with a hosepipe ban, drought and all the rest of it, says uh, that when uh, those of us who urinate standing up have finished, uh, we should just walk away and, uh, and not pull the chain, um, because that will save water. Indeed. Is this a horrible idea? Well, he also yes. suggests you put a brick in your lavatory, which makes these... I've tried this once during the last drought. It's, uh, it's the best way of making your bathroom floor soaked. You put a brick in... <laughs> And there's not very much in the system. And then it when would you certainly pull the handle... frighten the next person to use it, wouldn't it? The brick in <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it wasn't me. <laughs> Ken Livingstone, Mayor of London, has advised his citizens not to flush the toilet after a wee in order to prevent an acute water shortage. It's not the first time people in the South East have been advised on when to flush. During the last big water shortage, the headmistress of Haberdasher Ask School in Hertfordshire told pupils at assembly, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. <laughs> Advice the school bully took literally when the Chancellor came for the prize giving. <laughs> Charlotte, that's um, your old school. That's uh, my old school. Were you, yes. were you given that advice? Um, well, I've just one thing I have to say. The state of the loos and I was there, you wouldn't want to hang around in them very long. <laughs> well, hopefully you wouldn't be hanging around in them very long, would you? Well, no, hopefully. <laughs> it's not how I like to think of you. <laughs> I see you having a kind of Mary Archer fragrance. <laughs> <about you. laughs> 
Before we reveal the final scores, let's hear the cuttings the teams have brought along. Andy. Well, this is from Alicia Petty, and it's from the Belper News in Derbyshire. Tall player wanted. If you are six foot seven inches, tall, slim, and can play a wind instrument, then the Belper Town Wind Band will be pleased to hear from you. The band had a uniform made for a player of this size, but they promptly left. <laughs> Linda. Uh, Carol 50 sent this in from the Gloucester Citizen. Would the gentleman from Long Levins, who purchased two jigsaws in aid of the Tsunami Disaster Fund, one of which was a thousand-piece fluorescent one of Tower Bridge, please call on or ring the lady so that he can be given a piece which was found on the carpet after he left? <laughs> Lovely. They make their own entertainment in Gloucestershire. <laughs> Fred. Uh, this is from a monthly newsletter called Noise Management, and uh, Gosport Council were regaling tales of responses that they had gleaned from school visits where nine-year-olds uh, had been given talks on noise action days, and they were asked to name a profession that might need to protect their hearing, and the unexpected response was, Suicide bomber. <laughs> Uh, well, mine is from the Brighton Argus, Simon. It reads, Jason Morgan, a worthing man accused of receiving stolen property, sent word through his solicitor asking to adjourn the trial because he'd been involved in an accident. He had hurt himself falling off the back of a lorry. <laughs> Thank you. Now let's look at the final score. Alan and Fred have 15 points, but Andy and Linda clung to their lead and have 18 points. <laughs> and before we leave you, here's a question from the Adam Brooks Hospital Customer Satisfaction Survey, sent in by Matt Kimpton. Question 24 of 28. It would help us to know more about you, but this information is optional. Are you one, yes, two, no, three... <laughs> Partially. <laughs> well, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz were Andy Hamilton, Linda Smith, Fred McCauley and Alan Corrin. The chairman was Simon Hoggart and the news is read by me, Charlotte Green. The chairman's script was written by Lucy Clark, Simon Littlefield, Dave Cohen, Rodri Crooks and Paul Carenza. And the producer was Katie Tyrrell. Thank you.